A huge thank you and shout out to our newest Patreon subscriber, Clint Ware, all the way from Australia. Thank you so much, Clint. We hope you're enjoying all your extra content. And if you would like to get in on the extra content just like Clint, please check out patreon.com and look for Murder in the Rain. There are nearly 20,000 murders annually in the United States. Perhaps it's the weather, but the Pacific Northwest has become the notorious home of serial killers and bizarre crimes. We're here to discuss those murders, to try to understand the motives, respect and remember the victims, and explore the humanity of it all. I'm Emily Rowney. And I'm Alicia Holland. And And this this is Murder Murder in in the the Rain. Rain. In honor of February being Black History Month, I'm going to be telling you about two incidents surrounding persons of color whose story had a historic impact on the communities they lived in and rattled Portland. Today, I'm telling the stories of the devastating 1948 floods of Vanport and the brutal murder of Mulligata Syrah. As I mentioned in episode 18, as someone born and raised in the Portland area, my understanding of our lack of diversity was naive to say the least. As a kid, aware of just how white everyone was, I always assumed that people of color, especially African Americans, had been brought to the South for slavery. Then when the pilgrims started walking west, the free slaves were reasonable about not making that trek, and they were like, we're good, we're going to stay here. Sadly, the idea of my home being a utopia of love and welcomeness was shattered as I got older. It was then I learned that it wasn't the miles that kept Oregon a sea of white, Rather, it was our laws, politicians, and constitution. Going back to 1844, when Oregon was still a territory, a leader on the Oregon Trail, the first judge in Oregon, and the head of the provisional government of what would become Oregon, Peter Burnett, started to write laws. On the bright side, he made slavery illegal. But that's about as bright as it gets. See, he made slavery illegal because the settlers didn't want plantations taking over the land, and they didn't want to compete for work against the slaves. So on top of that, they were all super racist. Fun fact, Peter Burnett was at one time Joseph Smith's lawyer. Oh. So shout out to all the Mormons, even though I know they don't go by Mormon anymore. To enforce his ideas, Peter Burnett very humbly created the Peter Burnett Lash Law. (laughs) Very humble indeed. Very Any male slaves that had come with the pioneers would have two years, while any female slaves would have three, to get out of Oregon. If they did not comply, they would face 39 lashings every six months until they did. Oh, my God. Luckily, there is no record of anyone ever actually receiving the lashes. No record. No record of it. It didn't happen. Right. The theory is kind of that it was more preventative if you will you know if you hear mm -hmm, if you hear that that law is in place you know they don't have to actually enact it i'm sure someone did then in 1848 a new law was put in place forbidding anyone of color to live in oregon again the singular bright side was that this law in effect removed the lash law publicly the reasoning behind the new law was that there were concerns that black sailors would want to settle in the new land and they would then connect with the indigenous people and all of them hated whites so this was just an effort to stop a race war when again the truth was that they were just really really racist while these laws were in place there were still black men brave enough to stand their ground and live free in oregon One such man was Jacob Vanderpool, a black man that didn't leave and eventually had the police notified of his criminal activity by his neighbor. Jacob was then arrested for being black. Literally, his existence was a crime. When Oregon became a state in 1859, it was hailed as being inducted as a free state without slaves, when really it was the first and only state to be admitted to the Union as a whites-only state. Yikes. That's right, not Alabama, not Oklahoma, Oregon. And our white onlyness didn't get taken off the books until 1922, with the remaining racist language not being removed until 2001. Much like the laws against the Chinese in episode 19, similar laws were written against African Americans. 
unless you already lived here, the laws weren't exactly welcoming, with lines such as, it shall not be lawful for any Negro or mulatto to enter into or reside in Oregon. And, you know, you can't own real estate or land, etc., etc. Even when the 14th Amendment came into play, granting citizenship to former slaves, Oregon rescinded it until 1973. And when the 15th Amendment, allowing black men to vote, came through, there were six states that refused to ratify their own constitutions. Guess if Oregon was one of those six? We totally were. Moving into present day, it is Oregon's history of racism, refusal, and hateful laws that makes Portland the whitest large city in the United States. From a 2015 census report, our population of 612,206 was 77% white and only 5.8% black. Not surprising, our history and current lack of diversity has led to us being a hotbed for the KKK. So that's a bit of Oregon's ugly, legal, racist history, and now how those laws and mindsets came into play in the death of at least 15 residents of Vanport. In the mid-30s, President Roosevelt signed the New Deal. This put landmarks such as the Bonneville Dam on the Columbia River into place. Another part of the deal was creating a housing authority. Federal funds would be allocated to provide housing to citizens. Well, Portland passed on the housing bit. In a move that is very much not today's Portland, but the conservative Portland of the late 30s, the reasoning was that the idea was perceived as being too communistic and not American. Then came World War II. With war comes the need for warships. A very rich man by the name of Henry Kaiser was a pro at building them, so he took over the shipyards in the Portland area and started to build ships as fast as he could. But this would require workers. The call to support the war effort went far and wide, bringing ship workers and their families to the Portland area from all across the United States. In 1940, there were 2,000 workers, and by 1942, 15,000. This was quite the influx of people to the area, and there just wasn't enough housing. So Kaiser pressured the local government to accept the housing funding from the federal government, and it was now seen as the patriotic thing to do. In 1948, within a year of conception, the planning $26 million budget, building, and completion of a new 650-acre city was complete, and they called it Vanport. Needless to say, with that kind of rushed production, the homes weren't exactly built for longevity. They were made of wood, had no concrete in the foundations, and were as bare as they could be while still being livable. That being said, it was a progressive town even at conception, with half of the construction crew being female. Located in the far northeast area of Portland, but outside Portland proper, Vanport was a world within itself and was now not only the largest housing project ever constructed, it was also the second largest city in Oregon. So if you were going to describe today where it was, whereabouts? So it is um, off of I-5 okay. and it's basically the Delta Park area. So, and I get into more detail now about what's oh. there, but yeah, Delta Park um, kind of, it, it was right in between Portland and Vancouver, basically. Okay, cool. With the Columbia River to the north, Columbia Slough on the south, Denver Avenue on the east, and a railroad on the west, Vanport was a self-enclosed land that, before the dams had been built, was once actually under the Columbia. Vanport was bustling. With 40,000 residents, it was a combination of an idyllic little town and a military base. The shipbuilders worked around the clock, so the city really never slept. Buses and even the movie theater were running 24 hours a day. Whoa. Very cool. We have nothing like it's that like anymore. like a little mini Las Vegas. Yeah. When it came to the demographics of Vanport, it was, unlike the city, which only had a black population of 0.2%, had a population of 40% black residents. The diversity didn't end there, as there were also indigenous persons, Asian families, and more, all living and working together. While overall the Jim Crow laws were still in effect, Vanport was home to the only schools in the area that did not segregate, and they had the first black teachers in Oregon. Then came the end of the war. While the plan all along had been to demolish the poorly built homes, after the war ended, many people stayed and some new people even moved in, including Japanese internment camp survivors. Of the 18,500 residents that remained, many of them were black. This was because the laws in the surrounding neighborhoods did not allow for people of color to rent or buy property. 
landlords had every right to deny you a home based solely on your race. On top of that, the few properties available in the redlined areas of North Portland were occupied, so the family stayed. With so many empty buildings, yet a self-sustaining neighborhood, the spaces were then rented out and became dorms and classrooms for a college. The demographic of Vanport led to it gaining a bit of a reputation. It was perceived as a menace, a high-crime ghetto that would be referenced if you went into the city and you had mud on your shoes. You must be from Vanport was kind of a slur that was thrown around to anyone not meeting the higher society ways of downtown Portland. But a study did show that there was no difference in crime rates between Portland and Vanport. So that's the background of Vanport. Now, the geological history. The Columbia River is the largest river that contributes to the Pacific Ocean, covering over 250,000 miles, two countries, and multiple states the Columbia has dozens of tributaries. The Columbia is also the state line between Oregon and Washington, and it was a stone's throw away from Vanport and its floodplain. The winter of 1947 was a fairly uneventful one. The snow packed onto the mountains and awaited its slow disbursement from the snow caps down the creeks and rivers. But instead of a slow warm-up in spring, it stayed cold and wet, adding to the snow levels. That was until an abrupt warm front and storm came through in May. This not only dumped high levels of rain, but it quickly melted the snow all in one swoop. On May 1, 1948, the Weather Bureau gave warnings of high water runoffs. Flood hazards were increased and preventative measures started to take shape all along the Columbia's route. May 20 brought the first floods in Washington. Railways were washed out, creeks and other tributaries started to flood. While the Columbia usually ran at about 250,000 cubic feet per second, it was currently running at 1 million cubic feet per second. The Housing Authority of Portland, or HAP, initiated patrols around Vanport. Checking the dikes and making sure water levels were monitored, everything appeared to be business as usual. As the days went on and the river got higher, sandbags were put in place and patrols were increased to 24 hours a day. On May 29th, the Columbia River Highway was closed and 1,400 people were evacuated, so the Red Cross, HAP, and other emergency services held a meeting to make an emergency plan. Discussions surrounding the evacuation of Vanport were brought up. The Red Cross offered housing, but a final decision as to evacuate or not was never put in place. Instead, they planned a meeting for the 31st. Government work at its finest. I didn't know that. that I always they had thought people disregarded evacuation oh no Mm -mm. in the wee hours of may 30th bulletins were placed on every door in vanport it read as follows read this carefully and keep it in case you need to refer to it the flood situation has not changed since the prediction made last thursday that the highest water would come next tuesday that the dikes were high enough and strong enough to withstand the crest and that barring unforeseen developments vanport is safe However, the Housing Authority is taking every possible precaution to protect the personal safety of every Vanport resident in the event of an emergency. The plan outlined is as follows. 1. In the event it becomes necessary to evacuate Vanport, the Housing Authority will give the warning at the earliest possible moment. Upon the advice of the United States Army Corps of Engineers, warning will be by siren and air horn blown continuously. 2. Sound trucks will give instructions on what to do. These instructions briefly are as follows. A. Don't get panicky. You have plenty of time. Take such valuables as money, papers, jewelry, wear serviceable clothing, and pack essential personal belongings and a change of clothing in a small bag. Do not try to take too much. Turn off lights, stoves, close windows, lock your door. If you have a car, observe traffic regulations. Carry as many people as you can. If you haven't a car, go towards Denver Avenue or the railroad embankment, whichever is closest. Portland traction buses will operate in the project or on Denver Avenue, depending on conditions, to take persons to places of emergency shelter. Upon arrival at the shelter, the Red Cross will assume responsibility for registration and for emergency food, shelter, and clothing. The County Health Department will provide emergency medical care. Cases of sickness, old age, or disability where special assistance is necessary in case of evacuation should be reported now to the Sheriff's Office. If you can conveniently do so, you are encouraged to leave the port now for the next few days. And then in big, bold, uppercase letters. Dykes are safe at present. You will be warned if necessary. 
You will have time to leave. Don't get excited. With the notices read, everyone continued living their lives business as usual. Children were out playing in the fields when one young man, Ed Washington, saw something happening around the railway at 4.17 p.m. Ed looked over to see water was starting to come into the field from the bottom of the railway embankment, which, while it was tall, was only built to hold the weight of the train and was made of dirt. Smith Lake, on the other side of the tracks, was starting to fill with water that was now pouring into it from the Columbia. The embankment began to get washed away from the bottom. As the water churned and swirled, it started to erode the dirt of the embankment and make its way through the other side. Within moments, the water breached and washed away a 600-foot portion of the embankment, railway, and the wall that was protecting the citizens from the water. Thousands of gallons a second via a 10-foot wall of water started to rush into the neighborhood, a neighborhood that was chosen to be built there because it was so cheap, and it was so cheap because of its surrounding waterways, which made it basically a bowl sitting 15 feet below water levels, waiting to be filled. Being that it was a sunny Sunday afternoon of a holiday weekend, not only were people out of the city and enjoying the weather, but everyone was awake and able to move with urgency. There were talks of, you know, if this this had started at 1 a.m. on a Wednesday while everyone's home and in bed, it would have been much more catastrophic. Soon after the breach, a siren alerted everyone that evacuations needed to begin immediately. Children ran home as fast as they could to get away from the waves. Families ran out of their homes with only their children and pets in their arms. Some grabbed suitcases and made it up to the street. Others were quickly swept away while still in their homes, the cheap buildings breaking away from their flimsy foundations and floating around, crashing into one another like bumper cars, except that it was with apartment complexes and houses. And this left people stranded on their roofs. An additional piece of the whole cheap land thing was that Denver Avenue was the only way in or out of Vanport, So when 18,500 people needed to run and drive for their lives, it didn't take long for the singular route of escape to get clogged up. And it certainly didn't help that word spread remarkably quickly and people came by to watch the area flood, adding to the road congestion. As people started to make their escape, they were jumping into any moving vehicle, leaping into the back of moving trucks, and loading as many as they could onto buses before they, too, were overcome by the force of nature. The water was probably about knee-deep, and we got on a bus, and it got caught in the water, and we got off and ran a little ways, and we got on another bus. Well, the second bus of water caught it and started spinning it around, and it was moving toward a, a slough. The bus driver panicked and jumped off and ran to get out of the water, or ahead of the water. And uh, he hadn't opened the back door. And then I just kicked with both feet and uh, finally broke the door loose. And we got out and uh, was in the water. And actually the bus was still moving and this uh, lady handed me a baby out the window all wrapped up in a blanket and said, save my baby. And uh, I guess she thought uh, she wasn't going to make it. And it was just a pretty bad fight just to stay afloat. And uh, uh, two babies and my wife and uh, keeping them above water. All in all, it took 30 minutes from the initial breach to the entire community being completely destroyed, and within two hours, everything in Vanport was under 20 feet of water. The next day, Denver Avenue and the surrounding slough started to show signs of flooding. By that evening, water overcame Denver Avenue, cutting the only access road in half. Soon after, nearby Union Avenue broke, leaving hundreds of acres underwater and only further hindering rescue efforts. Eventually, people did come to help. Anyone with boats came by to help those that were stranded. Neighbors opened their homes to people of all colors. And the government was polite enough to expand the red lines of NOPO to allow for more people to move into the area. Since FEMA and other emergency services didn't exist, trailers were brought in for families to live in. 
But these weren't temporary manufactured home type trailers. These were old, rusty metal trailers, the kind you would tow behind your car. Some were so damaged, they barely qualified as livable. Local churches, schools, and the Red Cross and Salvation Army provided as much shelter as they could find. A thousand families were sent to the military barracks at Swan Island, which I didn't even know we had military bar- barracks on Swan Island, but, mm, you know. I didn't know that either. And while this was all well and good for the initial recovery, there was no plan in place for families once the dust had settled or for what the now 6,000 black people that were houseless would do. Five days after the flood, on June 4th, the initial bodies were recovered. The first victims were that of a two-year-old boy and his 11-month-old sister. All in all, 15 Vanport citizens lost their lives to the flood, and an additional 18 remain missing. The 2,000 other names on the missing persons list were eventually accounted for, and it was the largest loss of life and highest cost of property damage in the Columbia Basin. And I looked and looked and looked, but unfortunately I could not find any additional like name or age Mm. for any of the victims. It's just tucked away. On June 11th, President Harry Truman came to assess the damage across the area. This led to financial support for the state and the creation, in 1950, of the Flood Control Act, leading to additional dams being built and more efforts put in place to avoid situations like Vanport in the future. While 15 is the official government number for the death toll, it is not the number most people that lived in Vanport are willing to accept. Since the day of the flood, there has been an overall acceptance in the black community that there is a cover-up regarding the real number. Some people not being accounted for due to them being visitors for the holiday weekend and they weren't on any kind of roster. This conspiracy theory, if you will, is only fueled by information that has come out through the years. Information such as the fact that HAP employees took all of the important paperwork and documentation out of the files that were stored at Vanport just days before the flood, almost like they knew that there would be damage. With the lack of preparation from HAP, the nearly dismissive notice on the doors, and the knowledge that Hap and the city of Portland did not want Vanport to exist any longer, accompanied with the history of the treatment of black people in Portland, it is not hard to see why there would be a desire to allow such a burden to be easily washed away. Hap blamed the Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps didn't blame anyone else, but they didn't accept any part they may have played in the development of the ticking time bomb either. While a tragedy, there was some good to come from the floods. HAP, now home forward, actually teaches about this event in their employee training, taking ownership for their responsibility for what happened after all these years. Um, And I know that they teach that in their training because I actually worked for them for a short time. And this is my platform and I can say whatever I want and I won't talk about my personal feelings for them. But I will say if you are an artist or a vendor in the Portland area, they are not someone to work with. <laughs> they, right. they, we uh, can read between the lines. you know, they took four months to pay a vendor that I had hired, uh, to pay her $40 for her services. Wow. So, um, you know, support local artists such as, you know, street justice art and not home forward. That's all I'm saying. Don't work for them because they won't pay you. Okay. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> But personal feelings aside. That is, I could get way more personal than that. I am protecting my local friends that are artists and vendors. While it was unexpected and unplanned, the refugees from Vanport was the largest migration of black people into the city of Portland. This forced the local government to change the red line districts of North Portland and allowed for more housing to be available. While redlining is still total bullshit, it is a very small step in the right direction. In turn, this created the Albina District, which until a few years ago was the hub of Portland's black culture. That was until a freeway split it in half, followed soon after by the hospital buying a large area of land and forcing even more people out. Then came the hipsters and a plague of gentrification, leaving only a minute percentage of black people, let alone black-owned businesses, in the area. For a more fun way of digesting all this information about North Portland, I cannot suggest highly enough uh, the United Shades of America, which is available on Amazon Prime, and it's season one, episode six. Host uh, W. Kamau Bell walks you through the history of North Portland, what the present changes mean for the future of the people that really founded those neighborhoods. It's a really great show, so please check that out. Another highlight to survive the flood was a young Jackie Winters. She actually went on to become a United States senator where she created bipartisan bills fighting against lung cancer and any form of slavery in the Oregon Constitution. 
Inevitably, lawsuits were filed, and the judge found no liability on behalf of the Housing Authority, the Army Corps of Engineers, or the City of Portland. That doesn't sound right. Does it sound surprising, though? No. So the cases were totally thrown out. In the end, approximately 51 people lost their lives in the flood of 1948, which spanned across 34 counties, 100,000 acres of farmland, and 15,000 acres of developed land, spanning from Canada, Washington, Southeast Portland, the Dalles, and Kalama. And while every death is a horrible loss, it is those at minimum 15 lives that were lost at Vanport that continue to have a lasting effect on the black communities of Portland, lives that did not need to be lost, lives that were lost at the hand of neglect and apathy. You can actually visit what remains of Vanport to this day. While the Portland International Raceway cuts through the middle of the area and the sloughs are surrounded by a golf course, you can get off the I-5 at Delta Park and make your way to the field over there. And by the train tracks, you will find a slab of concrete that is partially broken down, partially covered by grass, and that, the foundation for what was the theater, is all that remains of what was once the second largest city in the state of Oregon. If you'd like to see the area and take a tour, please visit vanportmosaic.org. And actually in the summer, there is a Vanport Jazz Festival, which celebrates the culture and remembering the history of Vanport. Dike On, broke again. The dike bro now. Is that right? The dike broke through again. The water's coming through the underpass. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, have Sheriff Pratt tell you a little bit more about this and the cause of the excitement. Uh, yes, the uh, underpass we refer to is the, is the entrance into Vanport. And we've been afraid of that all evening, and I've just had word now that the water has commenced to come through, which means that Denver Avenue will be cut right in half just about the middle of Vanport. And uh, there's a great deal of excitement. The cars are moving back and forth. The, the police are routing the trucks and cars out because it means that Denver Avenue is going to be cut. So we're going to have to sign off here. Thank you, Sheriff Pratt. After the flood, college classes continued. Vanport College bought out other buildings and eventually bought an old school in downtown Portland where they renamed themselves Portland State University. It was the lure of an education that could be provided by Portland State University that brought Mulligata Syrah to the United States. Growing up on a farm in northern Ethiopia, Mulligata had big dreams of coming to the U.S. for schooling. Leaving behind his young son, Mulligata's father sold a cow to help his son achieve his dreams. It was 1980, and Mulligata was settling into Portland, attending classes, and working at a car rental company at the airport. He had made a life for himself, living at the Park Lane Apartments at Southeast 31st and Pine and immersing himself into the Ethiopian immigrant community. He was known for his gentle, kind, loving demeanor, always being even-keeled and being an overall great guy. But immigrants and students weren't the only people drawn to the Northwest in the 80s. After the Oregon Constitution was written and before the loss of Vanport, there were other milestones... Mm -hmm. In 1922, Walter Pierce, a member of the KKK, was elected governor of Oregon. Oh, yeah. Remember that? No, it was 1922. <laughs> he then served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from 1932 to 1942. In 1923, Oregon was home to the largest Ku Klux Klan west of the Mississippi. Fast forward through the remainder of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and Portland is starting to develop into the progressive city we all know and love it to be. But in what feels like a repeat of recent history, there was an unspoken anger boiling just below the surface. As the decades went on and laws finally started to catch up, the anger was fueled by the acceptance of the increasingly growing population of minorities. By the time the 80s rolled around, there was a cultural scene with roots coming out of the KKK what would today be called tiki torch carriers or just angry white guys, they were dubbed skinheads. And we remember that look, lots of military jackets, jack boots, and of course, shaved heads. This was when punk and metal were past the larva stage and some musicians had factioned off to use their platform to preach their hate and vile. In early 1988, a Chinese man was walking out of a restaurant with his family when he was attacked by a couple of skinheads. They were arrested, and friend of the show, Jim Redden, wrote an article about the scene and the incident. It was a warning that was not heeded. 
In what now seems like tragically comedic redundancy, the young white men claimed they just wanted to be heard and they should be able to seek out their rights just as much as people of color, although they didn't exactly use those terms. The man that was attacked called it out for what it was and in 1988 said, this is a form of terrorism. With white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and skinheads in abundance, a man named Tom Metzger sent some of his cronies up north from his headquarters in California to recruit racists from the group East Side White Pride to join his group, WAR, or White Aryan Resistance. WAR focused on hating all kinds of minorities and preached that the best way to handle such people was through violence. Both Eastside White Pride and War had been known to jump minorities that were just out by themselves. Unproven, I would assume that they were also connected to the Chinese man. On November 13, 1988, Mulugeta was being dropped off at his apartment that he shared with his uncle by two friends and fellow Ethiopian immigrants. Mulugeta got out of the car and was leaning into the window, chatting and saying his goodbyes. His timing was serendipitous because at the same moment there was a group of men leaving a party at the apartment complex nearby. And both of those are a bit inaccurate. By nearby, I mean next door. The apartment complexes basically shared a driveway. And when I say party, I mean a gathering of Eastside white priders, probably exhausted after spending the day handing out hate-filled literature, and they then spent the evening drinking beers, drawing racist cartoons, and just wasting their lives discussing their hate. Three of the men and two of their girlfriends got into their car and left after saying, we're going to go fuck up some inwards. Pulling out, they were probably overjoyed when they saw Mulligata and two other black men in a car. They were only a few feet from where they had just been riling each other up with talks of violence against minorities, and they saw an opportunity. The three men leapt out of their car and started to yell obscenities and slurs at all three men. Not letting the friends that were in the car out, Mulligata motioned his hands for everyone to just calm down. Then came the beating. One man started to kick and punch Mulligata before another of the attackers reached into his car and pulled out a baseball bat. Coming up behind Mulligata, he took a swing, then another, both striking him in the head. When Mulligata finally succumbed and fell to the pavement, the attacker took one final blow, splitting the bat and Mulligata's skull with the force. Being the cowards that they were, the attackers drove away. Mulligata was still alive and taken to the hospital, where he died from his injuries the following day. He was just 28 years old. It took eight days to arrest the three men responsible for Mulligata's death. This was thanks to a member of war making his way back to California before going to the police and sharing information that he had about a murder. This led to the arrests of 23-year-old Kenneth Minsky who was known for his music and acting, even befriending and working with Gus Van Zandt. 19-year-old Kyle Brewster, who was Grant High School's homecoming king and had a mother that was well-known in the liberal activism community, and 20-year-old Steven Strasser. Miski was also charged with racial intimidation after it was found that he was responsible for the non-fatal stabbing of a black security officer at a Safeway just two months before the murder. Kenneth was also the man wielding the weapon who dealt the fatal blow. Known as Ken Death in the metal scene and grotesquely as Batman in the skinhead. Oh, uh, really? In the skinhead scene, yeah. He went by Batman. During the trial, Kenneth gave his non-remorseful reasoning for the attack, that it was, quote, because of his race. When the guilty pleas were in, the sentencing came. Kenneth Miskey served a life sentence for murder at the Oregon State Penitentiary. He died last January from hep C complications. Whoa. Kyle Brewster, now 41, was sentenced to 20 years for first-degree manslaughter. He completed his sentence in 2002, but got into trouble last spring for assaulting a public safety officer in Umatilla County and was returned to prison. I searched and could not find him in correction files, so it's very possible he was released as recently as this last December. Um, and someone calling themselves Mrs. Kyle Brewster is very active on a white supremacist website praising her husband. So I'm assuming he's not exactly out of that scene. Yeah. 
and it's kind of hard to let go of the things that you are passionate about I guess well and when you're that young going you know you're 19 and you're going away for 20 years and yeah there's a huge scene in prisons of yes racial groups and hate groups and all of that and it's like I'm sure that just well we always talk about that like feeding off of each other's hate Mm -hmm. energy prison puts them all together yep. and then they form these cliques and when you have something in common like that it's only going to get worse it's yep. not you don't and yes i did learn. while googling him and figuring out when he was released i did accidentally end up on a white supremacist website so joy i hope i'm not in any kind of list now because i'm like wait why are they saying like one guy was like look i've been up. following his case for so long i'm so excited he's out i'm like why Ew. are you supporting and then she's like we love you mama and baby love you we can't wait to what a good man and he deserves to be free blah 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 like all this lovey-dovey i'm like what the hell and then i look and it was like i i I get loving someone despite their feelings on things but to an extent calling someone a good person (laughs) right after doing that Mm mm-hmm Steven Strasser, now 42, was also sentenced to prison for manslaughter. He completed his sentence November 19, 1999, and was released. But that was not the end of the courtroom drama surrounding this case. Mulligate's father and his now 9-year-old son teamed up with Morris Dees, whom would eventually found the Southern Poverty Law Center, and Eldon Rosenthal to sue Tom Metzger and Tom Metzger's son. Tom was a former golden dragon of the KKK and had founded the war movement. This was going to be a civil suit stating vicarious liability for Mm. Tom's preaching of hate and violence, leading to his followers obeying those demands, ultimately resulting in Mulligate's death. I feel like I heard a rumor that in those types of groups, everyone almost has a quota of doing these kinds of things. Probably. I mean, it's no different than like, you know, gang, you know, yeah, crips or whatever, where it's like, oh, yeah, you got to go shoot somebody or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, you got to prove your loyalty or whatever the madness is to be part of it. Um, So, yeah, so this was an interesting case because it was the vicarious liability, which you can say, well, I didn't. Well, I, I can't help. Cult, I have cult leaders. Like people mm-hmm. follow your ideals. I, but I setting. have freedom of speech. I can. I can't help that yeah, they it's decided to do that. Such a blurry line. Yeah. it really is. When going to court, Tom heard who his judge was going to be, and he realized that the judge was Jewish. Uh oh. So he and his lawyers fought and fought and put in a request for a new judge. They chose the Irish named Judge Haggerty. And in the babyest turn of karma, it turned out that the judge he fought so hard to get was the first and only trial judge in Oregon that was black. Oh, isn't that just so tasty? I love it. Yeah, so good. Uh, And there's this really great interview. uh, We'll have it in our sources on OPB with... um, uh, Mr. Rosenthal, his the lawyer in this case, and he talks, you know, that's kind of like this legal urban legend at this point of this moment of this guy fighting like, no, I don't want the Jewish lawyer. It's, give, give me Haggerty. It's that's- so great because Oregon's so white that your chances of oh, getting yeah. a white judge are very strong. So yes. it's just such it's ideal. So good. It's perfect. Yeah. And he and he the lawyer spoke about just like how this judge sat and like listen to this guy because tom actually represented himself Mm -hmm. and to listen to him spew his hate and like show these like horrific cartoons that they had drawn of black people getting like shot in the head and all this stuff and that the judge was just like cool just sat there and was like the ultimate judge of just he knew what was gonna happen in the end Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that you're gonna get more out of like not reacting Mm -hmm. you know tie their own noose on that one exactly So after listening to Tom's rambling of his hate-filled rhetoric, he was found responsible for the death of Mulligata. Damages were settled at a record-setting $12.5 million. Knowing that they would probably never get any money, his family and the community that loved him was happy with the outcome, as the goal overall was just to bankrupt war, which this did. Tom lost his cars and house and eventually his influence on the groups he had worked so hard to develop. For 20 years, all was taken from him. In total, it was only about $250,000 in damages that ended up being collected. After the verdict, Tom said, White racist movement, the white separatist movement, will not be stopped in a puny town of Portland. 
we're too deep, we're embedded now, don't you understand? We're in your colleges, we're in your armies, we're in your police forces. And it's also creepy because this, you know, was settled in, I, oh gosh, I think 89, all those years, 30-something years ago, and he's sitting there saying, and you could play it now, and I could tell you that that was someone on the news today, and you'd be like, yep, same, same, same. On the 30th anniversary of Mulligate's death, 16 Memorial Street sign caps were placed with his name, photo, and birth and death year in both English and Amharic, the primary language of Ethiopia. Local communities work hard year after year to keep the memory of Mulligate's life alive and to not get complacent after his death. It makes sense, white supremacists being prevalent in the Pacific Northwest. They're taking advantage of the numerical upper hand. And while we would like to hope that they're just the bullies our mothers warned us about, and if we just ignore them, they'll go away, we can't ignore them. We can't ignore that in the first six months of 2017, hate crime reports were already higher than all of the year 2016. Check out pdxresistance.org to learn how you can support the people and the movement of equality and love. Because hate never goes away, and we must be vigilant. You ready for my anecdote now? Yes. So I've talked to you about my former colleague before who did a stint in prison. Yes. And he, you know, was, didn't really have his parents in his life. And so he was in a gang and one of his close friends was part of war. Oh. And he was part of that situation. So it's very five degrees of Kevin Bacon or six degrees, whatever. Like I know <laughs> we'll someone who knows someone. It's kind of like he knows one of the three guys. I don't know if it was one of the people that actually participated in that or was just part of their close knit group. Gotcha. But it, he was explaining it to me and it was very uncomfortable. (laughs) Dang. I mean, he still keeps in contact with a few. He doesn't believe that, but like they're prison friends, right? The network and where you get that brotherhood through surviving all that stuff. And it's like, oh, I. I can't get worried about your belief system because we're just bros on this well, other level. Well, and when level. you get out of prison, they have little parties to like welcome you in and they all give each other money or whatever to get them on their feet. And so a lot of the people that maybe he doesn't want to see that he might know from his past are at those places. Wow. So it's a, it's interesting to hear his stories, to say the least. I bet. We got to interview that guy. He's willing. All right. Anything else? No, I hate that story, but it's it's a good one to share for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it was right kind of at the beginnings of Portland being, you know, lovey-dovey. Well, you yeah, know, like we were I, in I mentioned that zone. it in my episode in January mm-hmm. about the 1980s of Portland. Yeah. People see it as awesome music, punk rock, but they were still fighting to get that black school to desegregate, yeah. just to to mix our schools appropriately like the government wanted Mm -hmm. and people were scared for their lives because that was all over the news. It was a very scary time. Well, and you can look and go like, Oh, a hundred years is a hundred years. Like that's a long time. And it's like, that's only a couple generations of people. So to go from like whites only that blew my mind when I read through it all and is still alive, you know, like, (laughs) I don't think from when we were in Oregon territory, I don't know what, I don't don't think they're still alive, but to like, Reading out of just like we were the first and only one just sucks like that. Why is that? And also, why is that never taught? I never learned any of that in school. I don't think states like to share their darker side of of history. Right, but that's how you learn from it. I mean, I went through all of elementary school playing Oregon Trail because duh. Yeah, so we know people died of dysentery. Exactly. But it was never, there was never conversation. Like, why am I sitting there as a kid thinking, oh, I think they just didn't want to walk all that far because that seems insane. Why would you? If you have a house, you don't want to leave to this mystery land. That makes Mm -hmm. sense. You should know because then you learn what hate is and you learn what it sounds like and you learn what it looks like. I remember I didn't even really understand racism as a kid. I didn't have that concept until I think I saw a movie about it and somebody said the N word and I'm like, what does that that? mean? You know, and my mom's from Chicago. So she totally told me everything, different experiences. She went to a school that had a lot of black people, whereas I had two people in my school. So in one of the interviews I saw, they even mentioned, they were like, of course the KKK is here. Do you think they could go to Chicago and last five minutes? Like they're just, you know, it's an easy, it's shooting fish in a barrel. 
of I can be mad about black people because there are barely any here. So I look how big and tough and strong I am. But I think it's important to learn that stuff in school because people think it's the N word. People think it's, you know, racism and violence and all this stuff comes in a form of this, like it fits in a box. Mm -hmm. And it just it's doesn't. So much more than it's that. little stuff. It's little, like, it's looks, it's microaggressions, it's little words that are said or things you know whether a place is welcome you know gentrification of all of north portland that was racist you went to a place that was redlined by the government to be cheap housing because no one wanted to live up there and then it became the black neighborhood mm -hmm. and then all these people come and go oh these are such cheap places let's run everybody out. you know and it's like that's part of our history too it should yeah. all be taught and known i should know the history of well my they state. didn't at least in my high school there wasn't even an oregon state history class it was just part of oh yeah no classes. it was just yeah in washington you're required in high school to take a washington state history which is smart yeah i think it is i of course of course of course got out of that class because i'm like i'm going back to oregon i'm only here a year <laughs> i don't want to i don't it. need to know about your state <laughs> shout out to washington listeners <laughs> but i think it is a smart thing to outline we need to learn from our mistakes and it's okay to not think you're in a utopia because I was like, everyone loves everyone. I love all people of all it's colors. It's not racist here. Oh, yeah. Because we're all white. Yeah. Instead, <laughs> I can be like, oh, that person said something weird. They might be in the KKK because we have lots of them here. Apparently. Mm -hmm. Gross. All right. So. Um, Come it, visit Oregon. <laughs> so visit Oregon. Visit, you know, North Portland. But, you know, that was the other thing being said of after the gentrification of North Portland, you know, there isn't that like black community where it's everyone knows everyone they all live around there and they all have their businesses like they don't really have that there which on one hand is great because then you have people dispersed everywhere and people sure. can live wherever they want which is you know equality at like basic um but on a, you know you don't have that so there are plenty of i think there are specific websites that show Portland like black owned, black -owned businesses. businesses i was going to ask you do we have and we a do, guide on that um and we have sure. um there's a black owned business week, which I think is in November, maybe October. Um, and they list all of them and you just go and patronize, you know, go get some food, go get whatever, go shopping, go all those things and support those neighborhoods. Yeah, that's cool. So, well, let's, uh, if we have a link to something like that, let's share it. I definitely will. Happy black history month. And Emily's birthday month. <laughs> <laughs> Classic white girl making it about herself. Just kidding. We never celebrate my birthday because everyone steals it for their date night. Because it's actually on Valentine's Day. Whatever. <laughs> you may have heard in the past several weeks about the flooding going on in the eastern part of Oregon through Pendleton and Umatilla County. If you would like to help those affected, please Google C-A-P-C-O. They're a local organization that's helping evacuees secure housing and to meet immediate food needs. And of course, you can always donate to the Red Cross. Thank you. Well, if I had known he was an homophobic astro projector i wouldn't have been trying so hard he's so fun though like he was so he's so fun <laughs> he's so fun racism In utero. racism right? we're talking about homophobia, homophobia. I assume. but i'm getting which to, I'm what a great transition Can I speaking of racism really yeah, no what? no oh, you can't is she doing a bit Hi. i am recording she asked so and quick. i said no oh man fuck yeah i don't have to take them the other mom is gonna... See, he made slavery illegal... Blah, blah. Much like the laws against the Chinese in episode... <clears throat> <laughs> and that was all we had for a good run. Wasn't that nice? <laughs> 6,000... Wait. Why don't I know how to say numbers? <laughs> 612,206. Okay. A very rich man named Hendry... Hendry? I like that name. Hendry? Hendry, that's Henry's new name, I've decided. Hendry. <laughs> I'm just going to throw a D in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's just cut that out. All right. <laughs> that whole bit. I right, looked it up and I was going to start speaking. <gasps> yes. Oh my God, bitch. that no. is your job. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. No, go for it. I didn't Josh, look it up. Josh, 
Google that. Just for so me. you know, so no. I'm still the good kid. I, I just, didn't Google I'm, it. I'm still what PTSD from what? when I didn't do my job and she solved my entire case via Wikipedia. Talking? Oh my god! Which which one? <laughs> Mia. It was one item. I know, but which I felt item? like I dropped the ball. I'm we, so sorry. Josh, will you Google that for me sure. about Kaiser? Josh, is Kaiser, the city of Kaiser, now home to In-N-Out Burger, which is a whole nother situation. We don't have to do this, guys. Let's no, it's not happening. It. Let's not do it. <laughs> Tell me about it. No. With half of the construction. With the Columbia River to the north. Colu- oh, God. Because I've always known it as SLU. Yeah, I think it is, but I just want to make sure. SLU, slough, slough, slug, slug. Slappy, swampy. <laughs> Slip, slamp, sli- Samsonite. Samsonite. <laughs> Way off. While the plan all along was to demolish the poorly built homes at... Here we go. <laughs> the demographic of Vamp... Did I whistle so hard there? I felt like There's I whistled like... a little bit like... of a whistle. College. Sonny, want to come to my basement? <laughs> <sighs> I'll survive, though. Yeah. I've had a baby tear her way out of my vagina. She tore her way through. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Shoot her way out of your vagina. I got... <laughs> that kid's head brought me a hematoma. So she had a Months big old clot shrink. on her taint. And it was this big. Softball. Are you serious? A clot I on had your taint. S- sit like this for weeks. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that was not a fun story. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. You've seen that. Yeah, footage of like a birth. Yeah. And they cut it. Yeah, it's fucked up. You, you just get casually jolly watch off. birth videos? I just happened to. I don't know why. It was probably on like a... Curiosity. Net Pornhub or something. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> probably. <laughs> He's like, oh, oh episiotomy Ooh. looks good. Let's Real Ooh. birth hot. Check that. Oh God. <laughs> that is You disgusting. know that's on there. And it's sexy. No. Okay, real no. birth hot. No. God. Are you on Pornhub? I am. You want me to go to your site? No, just take okay. <laughs> You shush. <laughs> uh, take out hot. How did we oh, get Oh, wait, did I say that? college? Okay. <laughs> yes, you did. College. That's where we started and ended up on pregnant women on Pornhub. What <laughs> the fuck? It's we, like a Simpsons episode. We Starts are one thing, dark. Ends in another world. <laughs> That's like a really terrible game of like word association. Okay, I'm going to say college. Pregnant women on Pornhub. Yes. <laughs> Man, I really want to play taboo and have college be one of the words and then just use that as the <laughs> clue. Next time we ever play taboo, <laughs> it's happening. We get the word college, baby. Pregnant women on Pornhub. College. college. <laughs> With so many empty buildings, yet a self-sustaining neighborhood. This, Except I bit my own fucking tongue. <laughs> No one else is going to do it. God. God, mom, leave me alone. That's Got what I my room. That's what I heard, okay? So do not enter. Taking ownership of their responsibility. In the end, approximately 51 people lost their lives. Their loves. I don't know who broke up or what because of a flood. That's not what we're talking about. Murder in the Rain is produced and edited by Josh McCullough. Written and hosted by Emily Rowney and Alicia Holland. Artwork by Jamie Costa. Music by Kai Pfeiffer at kyfifer.com. Check out our website, murderintherain.com, for additional information on all cases, a fun interactive map, and be sure to subscribe so you can receive our newsletter. Check out the Mad Props page for coupon codes from some of our sponsors. We love your reviews and seeing them on all streaming platforms, especially iTunes. And check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And suck my balls. (laughs) Please put that in. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.